What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 44 Division Podcast. I am your host, Colette Abdallah, and I'm joined today by a special guest, a good friend of mine, Aaron Fishman, who is the host of the On the NBA Beat podcast and author of A Baseball Gaijin, which is the topic of today's episode. Is a very cool book that Aaron wrote, and I'm going to hold up a copy here for those of you watching on YouTube. So go ahead and uh, make sure you go out and buy this, and we'll talk a little bit about where you can find the book at the end. Uh, but Aaron, how you doing, man? Hey, Claude, I'm doing well. Thanks for the introduction. I like uh, you holding up the copy of the book. Your beard goes well with Tony's <laughs> facial hair and long hair on the cover there. But um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be joining you today. Of course, man. Thanks for coming on. So we're going to talk about this book. We're going to so just a quick kind of synopsis. I mean, it's it's a the elevator pitch basically. It's about a pitcher named Tony Barnett who is chasing some major league baseball dreams and in the process of doing that goes to Japan and plays professional baseball there for about 6 years before making it back to the major leagues. So he starts in the minor leagues, goes to goes to Japan and then comes back and uh, makes it to the show. So I know it's uh, we don't want to spoil too much about the uh, you know, the details of the book, because there's a lot of twists and turns along the way. Uh, but let's take it back. What was your primary inspiration behind this book was, did you meet Tony? I know you've known him for a while, but did, did yeah. you have this idea kind of brewing for a while? Yeah, it's interesting how it unfolded. So I was a freshman at UC Davis, and I was writing for Davis Sports Daily, you know, Davis Sports Daily. Um, and I was reaching out blindly to minor league pitchers. These were pitchers in double A. I had no information about them other than they had some good K to walk ratios. They, they logged innings. I think I reached out to, I don't know, four five, six. This was on Facebook, kind of the early days of social media. And I think people were a little bit less guarded about doing interviews with media. And he was kind of an anonymous minor league player. And he had a story to tell. His story wasn't that interesting yet, but he was right off the bat, really charismatic and engaging and interesting. But he was a double A pitcher in Mobile, Alabama. So he hadn't yet gone to Japan. He hadn't even been invited yet to the Diamondbacks major league spring camp which was interesting when he was, he blogged a little bit about that, talked about how he crossed paths with Randy Johnson, for, in, for in, uh, instance. But uh, he did some interviews with us. They were transcript interviews, so not even over the phone back then. I would just email him, uh, Facebook message him a list of questions. He would respond. Then he started blogging for us, which was really great. As I said, he wasn't even in Japan when he started, but then that's when his story really got fascinating to me. When he went to Japan, he was there in March of 2011, as you know, when the earthquake and tsunami hit. He blogged about that for us at Davis Sports Daily, probably within four days of it or something, which I thought was really cool that our readers were getting a, a snapshot of what he was going, he was dealing with, or what the country more broadly was dealing with, and the Tohoku region such a tragedy and so beautiful how they recovered even though the process still is going on to this day but that was that was so fascinating but that's still so long ago that was at the very beginning of his journey 2010 was his first season in Japan so and as you mentioned that at the top he ends up spending six seasons there and so it's been a really long journey I can delve into more specifics but for a while, it was not going to be turned into a book. It was in 2016 when I had that idea because it felt like it's finally a marketable idea in the U.S. Once he got that major league contract with the Texas Rangers and he was going to make his major league debut at, at the ripe old age of 32, which isn't really that old. We, we shouldn't act like yeah, it's right. old, but I, <laughs> I guess for MLB, yeah, let's let's not say it's old. But uh, yeah, so. That's when I I approached him with it. We had stayed in touch over the years, and he was receptive and enthusiastic about it. And this was, I can't remember if it was, I think it was a couple months before his rookie season was just getting started. But he had a lot going on then, and 
and his wife Hillary was was just amazing at the time and throughout the process. During the seasons, he's obviously extremely busy, has a lot going on, is traveling a lot. And so so she was invaluable throughout the process. A lot of people were, and we'll get into it, but mm -hmm. I'm just so grateful for her. So I could delve into more specifics, but I think that's a, that's a good big picture rundown of, of um, how it happened. So I've been in touch with him for something like 15 years now. It's, it's pretty cool to watch him grow and and him watched me grow, I, th I think, from what he said. And we just stayed in touch all these years. Yeah, I think we were both at Davis around the same time. And, you know, was it? Uh, I graduated in 2009. So that's been about 15 we years. We overlapped. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a little ahead of me. I was 07 to 2011. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. yeah, so I thought, I mean, once I saw the Davis Sports Daily part, I was like, okay, I guess they've known each other for a while. But I thought that, you know, when you initially posted about the book, I thought you kind of maybe found the story some other way, you know, just by trolling around on the internet or whatever. And then you decided to write the story. But the fact that you've had this relationship with him kind of adds another layer to me, at least the fact that you not only have you, are you chronicling this journey, but you've been kind of part of it, right? Because you known him when he was in the minors and then all the way through, yeah. like you said, you guys have been able to keep in touch. So you've kind of gotten the the inside scoop it's not everything it's just a you know a retelling of what happened yeah that's so. a cool that's a cool way to look at it and even though as a journalist and you could probably understand this i'm not often comfortable being part of the story um and i i'm not i'm in it other than in the epilogue um where or not epilogue sorry acknowledgments um where I, obviously i'm writing it from my perspective as an author but um but no you're you're right i am part of the story i mean not part of the the narrative, the the inspirational narrative, but but no, he's been a big part of my life, and um, and then um, there's one other thing I was gonna say I forgot. Um, oh, just that we've known e the fact that we've known each other so long, as you alluded to. I don't want to say that the book has been easy to write. It's been a challenge. It's my first book, it um, it took a long time, but one thing that was really cool and helpful is. I was interviewing him in real time throughout it. Um, so it wasn't like I'm asking him to remember things that happened five, six, seven, eight years ago and memories are fuzzy and that's just the nature of journalism. People embellish, people just remember things, misremember, or you talk to multiple sources and they say different things. But I was fortunate enough to talk to him and the people around him in real time. And so that made it more authentic and made it more accurate. And so that was, that was a special part of the process as well. That was another thing I wanted to ask you about was the, the research behind it. Again, when I was initially formulating these questions, I didn't know about this background. Again, of you, again, not being part of the story, but at least kind of being aware of what's happening all the way through. So aside from the interviews that you have over the years and just the fact that you guys have been able to keep in touch. So you probably have some, some things that stand out in your own memory. What was the, I mean, there's different parts of this question at least, but for the, the part of his story specifically, what was that research part? Like, were you fact checking certain things, making sure that, you know, that what you noted down or what he talked about in his interview was accurate just to make sure. And then I guess the larger question on the research was just the, the, everything about Japanese baseball in general, because you talk a lot about the history of it and, you know, different aspects. So let's talk about the personal part of the story about him and that research, and then kind of the overarching other uh, history research that you were doing. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So there are things where, um, baseball specific things where, First of all, I was always really impressed by his memory when um, there there's something that was somewhat seemingly obscure or something in my mind. And then I'd go back and and he wasn't Tony wasn't right 100 percent of the time, but very high percentage. It feels like way more than I would be where he remembered. So and so hit a double off the wall against him or something or Willie Mopena hit a warning track 
fly ball um, off him in the All Star game. That that makes a little bit more sense because he wasn't he he appeared in two All Star games in Japan. But there were specific, seemingly obscure examples where he would be either a hundred percent accurate or maybe a slight detail would be off, and that could be something that happened three or four years earlier or something. Um, yeah, it was like, like there's a lot of specific like at bats something... that you talk about. You're like, oh, you know, it was, a, yeah. it was a three three one count, and then this happened and that happened. Yeah. So you get kind and of he's the specifics. Telling me what ha- exactly, and he's telling me what happened. And like I said, his um, memory is strikingly accurate. And then, but I'm fact checking it, so um, I was able to get um, box scores and, and game logs. So this is interesting, but also a little bit sad. There are a couple. Japanese baseball websites that are in English that are now defunct that were really good and comprehensive and made my job a lot easier. One is called Yaku Baka. Yaku means baseball in Japanese, and um, by this run by this guy named Jen G E N, and it, it was around for a really long time. I, um, I think it's now Yaku Database, and you need a subscription for it, but it had everything. It was um, not only box scores, but play by play. So it would say every single play would happen. It would. So it's like a baseball count. reference, but but for Japanese yeah. baseball. Yeah, but more even more. Well, I mean, well, yeah, baseball reference has everything. But so Yaku Baka would also have not just every date and game, but it would also have um, injuries. When a player is register uh, was activated or deactivated, they call it deregistered in NPB. And um, then when they return off the injured list, um, what the injury was, it was amazing because there aren't a lot of things that are in, in English, and I don't speak Japanese. Um, um, <laughs> and I learned very basic stuff when I went there, uh, but. So that was really cool. It had attendance numbers for um, all 12 stadiums um, at the end of each year. It would have the ranking uh, by total attendance and percentage. Anyway, I could go on and on, but that was one that was really good. And then um, TokyoSwallows.com, which, as you know, you know about it because it's featured throughout the book. But as an English language fan site, and David Watkins is the main guy featured. And he and Rob Small, the Canadian sports writer who no longer lives in Japan, he's in Canada now. David's still in Japan. But, and TokyoSwallows.com is no more, unfortunately. But yeah, those two guys were early sources who, who speak English, of course. And they were so generous with their time. David especially, they both were, but I want to highlight David because of the the time difference. And he would navigate it, I would too. But we were talking at crazy hours. Sometimes it would be 5.30 a.m. in Los Angeles just so it could work work for him. And it was nighttime there, usually a 16-hour difference. I think it might be 16 and 17, depending on daylight saving. I'm not sure. But... um, but yeah, so those two great, amazing sources that really helped me get into it. And so they they kind of were a gateway, I guess you could say. And they introduced me to other people. David hosted me. I mean, I didn't stay with him, but he gave my friend Jonathan and me a tour of of various parts of Tokyo one day. I went to two games at Jingu Stadium where the Swallows play with him. I also went to a game at Tokyo Dome with my friend Jonathan because David does not, he's hes not about Tokyo Dome. He he, he hates the Yomiuri Giants. Yeah, I was going to say that's a dome. real rivalry. <laughs> he's not going to step foot in there. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure if I completely answered your question because there's so many layers to it and I could talk for a long time about it. But another thing is the reporting process. I mean, I was just talking about research and reporting right now. So these those guys and then other Japanese, native Japanese um, people or or um, Japanese speakers who who live in the U.S. Um, that there were um, there's a guy named Kaz who was really great. 
Um, Jason Koskri is an American who writes for the Japan Times. He was really great, a great resource. Jim Allen, another American now in Japan. And um, so I, people were recommended. I saw them on Twitter. I would reach out to them. A lot of people were really kind and responsive and, and generous with their time. And some people I interviewed one time only, two, three times. And then David Watkins, Rob Small, I interviewed again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, Watkins particularly, well, Rob actually too. I didn't ever feel like I was bothering them. I could just email them all the time um, and they'd get back to me in a timely manner. And, um, and it was great. But like I was starting to say from the reporting process, if Tony would tell me something, Hillary, was, it was helpful to have her verify. And then sometimes they would be like, he said that? I don't, I don't know about that. Or, <laughs> um, and I mean, a lot of these, you just attribute it to someone. You can't 100% verify it. But there are things that w one of them said that ended up being wrong that I was able to figure out by asking other people or looking up somehow. Um, like I said, most of the stuff was really accurate. They were both a, a wealth of knowledge and information. And um, so you just try to talk to as many people as you can, try to talk to people who might know certain things. And then there okay. are things that are th that you deem are important and you can't really verify. Um, and so if, if you don't want to get it wrong, you just don't include it. And there are so many things. This book was on pace to be so long. And it's still a little bit on the longer side, but I ended up cutting a lot progressively and I think it strengthened the storytelling and made it better. At first I was afraid to cut much, but going along with that, it's just, there are a lot of things as a writer where it's like your baby. It's a cliche, but people say that and I can, I can relate to that where you're so attached to the material. You think certain things are so fascinating or cool, but then if you're honest with yourself and you take a step back and you think, is this really serving the purpose of the narrative? Would the average reader even notice that I, I omitted it? And is the story worse off for not including it? And there was something, a lot of things that at first I was resistant to taking out. For instance, there was a lot more about Yuhei Takai who ended up just shortening his name to Yuhei. He was a two-way player with the Swallows left-handed pitcher kind of like Rick Ankiel who just lost control had had the yips and ended up being converted into an outfielder and had some power like Rick Ankiel and he had that sayonara hit to win I think it was to win the climax or to win the it was to win the pennant for the swallows in 20 2015 mm -hmm. in in NPB if you remember, winning the pennant means having the best regular season record in your league. So, so that won the Central League for them. Yeah. And then later, of course, they eliminated the Giants to advance to the Japan Series. But, but so he was their hero for that game to get them the pennant. But so I had a lot of in the weed stuff about his transition from pitcher to hitter, but I never spoke with him and. He's not a focal point of the book. So even though I think it from a nerdy perspective, that's so fascinating. And I, I want to include more of that stuff. It wasn't necessarily serving the narrative as well. And it was taking up space. Mm -hmm. and so you have Makes to make sense. decisions like yeah. that. But Yeah. yeah. Um, what, I, what I really appreciated about the book was the fact that, you know, the through line in the main narrative is Tony's story. And, but... I like that you used it kind of as a narrative device to tell the story of baseball in Japan in general and, you know, how, how it's, how it started, the, the popularity there, uh, some of the other gaijin that are there, which mean, you know, the foreign players that, that come to Japan to play. So I like these, you know, characters, little minor characters that would pop up here and there and you tell their story about, you know, their exploits in, in, in baseball there. But what what was really fascinating to me was the cultural differences that that popped up between you know American baseball and Japanese baseball because obviously at the core of it it's the same game the rules are the same you know there's there's no fundamental difference but just the little ways that the the little differences I should say in the in the two culturals and how that played out so 
you went to Japan to, to, and it, you said in 2018 before the, the before we started recording, mm -hmm. yeah. what did you see, you know, firsthand? And then what did you see in your research that th where the cultural differences played out, you know, on the baseball field or in the stadium? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and that was a, a phenomenal experience. I was in Japan for two and a half weeks with, with my friend, Jonathan Santiago. And, just in Tokyo, but just isn't the right word because Tokyo is so expansive and there's so many different diverse communities, districts, wards within Tokyo. And we stayed at three different places. We went to two stadiums, as I just mentioned earlier, Tokyo Dome and Jingu Stadium. One of the games at Jingu was drizzling. And that was an interesting experience because they have the mini umbrellas. And so it came in handy. but. The, that's the thing I want to highlight the most is is the crowd, the atmosphere in the crowd, and just these personas. I don't want to overgeneralize, but I've read about this and I've talked to people about this there. David Watkins has talked to me about this at length. There's almost like a, a buttoned up personality. It's a little bit of a stereotype, but it's true in a lot of ways with the mm -hmm. Japanese businessman who and or woman who they're just kind of straight laced. I know I'm overly generalizing, but it's just a thing where um, you're so serious about work there. You put in so many hours. You can't really let your hair down. You're working like crazy. And then this is where these, these fanatics, for lack of a better term, just they just let loose completely. And it's almost like, like a split personality or like another persona. It, when they when they arrive at the stadium or when they put on the jersey and they show up, they kind of leave their other life behind. And it's so beautiful. And I didn't really recognize it. Um, no offense to American sports fans, but it's just completely distinct. It's probably a lot like, even though I've, I've never been to a football game in Europe, probably, probably like that. Um, you mentioned American that in the book. Soccer. It had that, that kind of atmosphere where they're, there's a lot of uh, like synchronized chants and singing yeah, and horn, like horn horns. Yeah. There's choreography. Um, every player has their uh, own. Every batter has a customized cheer. Um, for Balancine, who's a home run hitter, they they're um, gesturing beyond the fence, like uh, mimicking a rainbow, the trajectory of a rainbow. Um, it's sending, very much a, a European. Send it over the crowd. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say it's very much a European soccer thing. I mean. If you European, go to European or just or just fan, yeah, right? soccer in general, right? Every yeah. player has their own chant with like the ultras. They have, uh, you know, different routines and things that they do. Different again, different chants or songs for every player. There, um, yeah, there was a Josh Whitesell quote in the book. He was acquired mid-season in 2010, and uh, American player, of course, and he um, he says something like that that. Um, I think I don't know if he if that was if he said it reminds me of European soccer or something, but he said it's just you hear the you hear the horns and the band going and you're just transported. It's just a completely another place and and you realize it instantly. And I mean, you asked me also possibly on the field. There, are yeah, things, that was a big part. Yeah, I wanted to ask about was the how it played you out. Don't necessarily on the field. notice on the field as much. Uh, I mean, it's just for me, just being in the crowd, it was more the home team crowd. They're they're standing the entire time their team is batting. You never sit down, and uh, and you're kind of looked at weird, like what's wrong with you if you're not standing? Um, and so you just stand. You don't you don't think about it. And um, uh, people really take care of each other. There's like a it's kind of it's a little bit of a gendered thing, but there there's there's someone they call like like their like their house mom, um, older woman who um, she gave us newspapers to put our bags on when it was raining. Um, actually, no, both times she gave she gave it um, to us, and um, she was offering us food that she brought. Um, not not even bought at concession concession stands that she brought with her, um, and um, 
she she was a character. She was so superstitious. When the team was batting and had runners on base, she would go to the bat. She would leave to go to the bathroom, um, and was laughing. And I didn't completely understand. And the people that I was with, um, they said, "Oh no, she doesn't really have to go to the bathroom. She's just superstitious. She just she can't bear to watch. She's just such a fanatical. She's she's just so so big of a fan." Um, the the one one thing on the field, they play more station to station baseball where there's more sacrifice bunts and ground ball to the right side to get the runner over to third for then a sacrifice fly, uh, more stone bases, I believe. It's less of the stereotypical, let's get a guy up, hit a three-run home run, and put some crooked numbers on the board. But that's changing. And um, as you read in the book, Mitsuro Manaka, the manager who guided them to the 2015 Japan series. He was he was more new school in his approach. He was younger, but also he didn't really bunt as often and and uh, he was more of an innovative thinker in terms of strategy. And that so um as with a lot of things these days there's there's more similarities globally. It's not as distinct to the Japanese brand of baseball and the American brand. Mm-hmm. So so um they're becoming more similar, but that that was one difference. And it was already starting to change by then. As as you said, I went in 2018. So that was already after Manaka had, had already joined joined um joined the squad and as manager. But there are a lot. There's a like lot the, I could say. So now it's the it's like the, the now I know in, in Major League Baseball one maybe it's a criticism, but it's kind of the style of like it's either a strikeout or a homer. You're not trying to get on base again. It's, you're not playing that that station to station. It's you know yeah. It's more like that. It's not. I wouldn't mm-hmm. say it, um, it's completely gone that way because Japan they played a certain brand of baseball for so long, and so so old habits die hard, but. It's definitely it's more similar to the to the MLB style than it ever used to be. Okay. But yeah, there's still some distinct differences though. Yeah. And the other thing yeah. I wanted to ask about was the uh the behavior on the field and the cultural differences there. So I feel like in American baseball, person. obviously there's still a lot of like the unwritten rules, like if you showboat or if you, you know, have a, a nice bat flip, you're gonna get beaned uh in the next uh you know, your next at bat. Uh but what I what stood out to me was you talked about how they had such little tolerance for I mean, you call them outbursts, right? Which I think is a very big part of baseball here. It's like if a, if a pitcher's having a rough, a rough outing, he's going to go in the dugout after he's pulled from the game and throw some coolers and do all that. Yeah, and, you know, you have so. managers coming out, kicking dirt at umpires and getting thrown out. <laughs> and it felt like maybe Japan as a more, you know, less individ- individualistic society is not, doesn't have room for that. Is it just yeah. for the foreign players or is it like for the for the native players as well? Do they have any room to do that? That's a really good question. There are definitely fewer histrionics, I guess you could say, just in general. And from my understanding, um, obviously not growing up there, but just from the reporting that I've done and, and what I've read, they're socialized from an early age to be a part of the team not only literally the team but just society you're everyone is in this together not that we're not like that in the west but it's way more individualistic and um you're taught you're special as a kid and um what makes you um different and unique makes you great and um harmony group harmony wa as they call it is just emphasized so heavily over there there's a a saying that they often use it's um some what is the nail gets hammered in not now i messed it up but if there's a nail that's sticking out it gets hammered in it's basically like um you fit in with everyone you don't call attention to yourself it's borderline disrespectful to do that because you're detracting from the greater good when you're freelancing on your own and doing your own thing. So they're socialized to be that way. So um, 
I would guess I could be wrong that that um, native Japanese players have a little bit more leeway to do things because gaijin are are looked at under a microscope. There aren't that many of them, so they already stand out like a sore thumb. So first of all, their production, they have almost no margin for error because they'll just bring in another gaijin and there are only spots for four on the active roster. So that's one thing. But if you're misbehaving on or off the field, calling unwanted attention to yourself, then they don't really have much patience for that. There are, I mean, we I talk about this, that players get demoted often, highly paid foreigners, including Tony, of course, his his first season in Japan, he got demoted often. He was in the minors as much as he was in the majors almost there, the, which they call the Nigun level is, is uh, the minor league level, not the notch below, and Ichigun is the, the top level. But so, and it's recoverable. Like him, it's not a huge deal. If you're making a lot of money and you get demoted, you can get promoted again and, and have staying power, which is what happened with Tony. Remade his game when, when he was uh, sent to the bullpen. But yeah, I think I think native Japanese players have a little bit more leeway, but still, they just don't want to really... They're, they're just naturally not going to be showing that much emotion. Whereas in the U.S., it's kind of seen as, um, okay, that shows that a guy cares and that he's passionate and he wants to win. You kind of are taught that that's it's not such a bad thing um, if someone does that. They have fire. There are all these yeah. positive euphemisms for it. In Japan, it's just, come on, you're, you're hurting the team. Show you're, some respect. Yeah, you're taking the focus away from the collective and you're putting kind of the spotlight on yourself. Uh, it's almost of... seen as like a little narcissistic. It's like, it's not about you. This is a team sport. Yeah. yeah, which is, I mean, I know baseball is a team sport, obviously, but it's probably the most individualistic. It's the most of individual the, of the yeah. yeah, You know, it's exactly. it's one-on-one yeah. every time. It's 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 not quite tennis, but but just about. In certain, and you said uh, something, things. yeah, you just said something that reminded me of Tony describing when he's on a mound in Japan, um, especially on the road, because as I talk about, the crowd is silent when, when their team's on defense. They they don't root. They don't root for the team on defense. So and that's when he's on the field as a pitcher. But but let's just talk about it from a road perspective. So on um on the road, the fans are going crazy for the visiting team against him. So it's it's raucous and when he's on the mound and so. Th- you can get rattled really easily, which is part part of what happened his first season, and um, and among a, a many other things. But they're going crazy, and they don't care about him. So it kind of feels like you're on an island there on the pitching mound. You have your team and defense behind you, but the crowd is just going crazy, and it's not for you. And uh, and they have the the horns and and the chants and. It it just feels so amazing if you're part of it, but you're on the other team. They're they're doing they're they're harnessing all this energy against you, and so that takes an adjustment. But it's also really special and cool to be a part of that and, um, and be performing on such a stage like that, even on the road. He also talked about um, the at home the mini umbrellas. I thought it was beautiful imagery. He described it as it looks like jellyfish bobbing in the water, the the mini umbrellas going up and down. And I thought that was so cool. He, When that happens, he's in the dugout or bullpen, be, usually bullpen as a relief pitcher. But so because the team is batting and that, that only happens when they score. And, and then you see, you, you hear the song, the Tokyo Ondo song going and, um, the jellyfish bobbing, bobbing in the water, and it just I just wanted to talk about it again, even though we, mm-hmm. we kind of were t- done talking about that. And, and no, no, it's it's, it's a it it's a really cool like cultural so vivid. quirk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I mean, in terms of of his story, it just 
uh, obviously it's super inspirational almost to the point where it, it feels fake it's like a disney movie <laughs> where the way the way it plays out um you know you mentioned uh the fact that he uh the the earthquake happens when he's there um and then that's a, a it's a method for people to come together it becomes like this collective moment for them to come together it kind of reminded me a little bit of you know post 9 11 sports and also yeah. post COVID, well, not post COVID, I guess during COVID sports of like the question of how soon is too soon to come back together and experience the joy of, of sports. And like, is it something that we need? And then it becomes like, yeah, this is something that, that distracts from, from the tragedies and everything that's going on. So I, I wanted to hear before we talk about the rest of his story, I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. And if you, did you make some of those same parallels as well between COVID and 9-11 and, and the earthquake as well? I did. And I thought it was so fascinating. And I love your question. I didn't get a chance to talk about this in either of my first two interviews. And those two chapters on the earthquake and tsunami are so important and meaningful to me for a lot of reasons. I think we love we love sports and we see the power in it. and what it what it could do for people and what it can make you think of and and how it can put things in perspective and how important it is for kids just to learn work ethic it's just it's just so valuable but still in the scheme of things it's just a game it's not life and death and sometimes we lose sight of that and i just thought i'm talking about this it happened during the time I really need to give it some serious gravity and weight and spend some time on it, not just mention it in passing and actually delve deeply into what happened, some of the the macro stuff, stuff about NGOs and nonprofits and protests about nuclear energy and what the players are doing to donate their time and money and the behind the scenes negotiations between the commissioners and the controversy over it all. And I thought of nine 11 first because the giants owner was seen as the ringleader kind of where he was kind of like, for lack of a better term, he was kind of the evil corporate guy that was just trying to just put butts in seats and, just just make money that way and rush rush back to play. And the Pacific League had two stadiums that were damaged, including one that was damaged really, really badly. Um, and there were also issues with energy and, um, and conserving energy. And so they had to play a lot of day games or they had to, to play in, in different areas. And... Um, that's more important what the the people are are getting electricity but it's also it was a source of hope it it gave people a reason to dream when they were displaced from their homes or or they lost one or multiple family members and friends and so it's kind of a tricky thing to think about and talk about because i feel like in a sense maybe i'm trivializing the the disaster by saying that or overemphasizing how important baseball was, but it really was important for some people. It it was such a welcome distraction where you're just dreading your everyday existence or or someone you love so much is no is no longer there. And um and they're never coming back. And um and this sport, it just the stakes are not as high. And it, it allows you for three hours a day, every day, to just um, to just immerse yourself in that world, even if you're not going to games, and um, they weren't for a while, but just watching it on TV, listening to it on the radio, and then you go back, um, and it's over, and um, you, you have to go back to the difficulties of everyday life, but um, it, it did so much for some people, um, but I, I just wanted to, to honor um, how important it was in so many people's lives in, in the country and more specifically the Tohoku region. And um, and kind of like you alluded to before, Tony was in Yokohama 
he wasn't in the Tohoku region and he has no ties to the Tohoku region. But it's, this book is about so much more than Tony. It's centered around him, but I just, I just think these stories, these related stories were important to tell and in an in-depth, comprehensive, thorough way. And it allowed me to showcase a different side of my research and reporting too. I read this fascinating book on it, on on the tsunami and earthquake and, and the recovery. Um, and the name escapes me right now, but it's it's in the bibliography. And I believe Kingston was was um one of the the primary editors of that and um but it's a good book it's it's in the um it's in the bibliography and i read that and i got a lot of information from that and and various online sources but also just of the two chapters you know this but the Mm -hmm. first one is more anecdotal where it's through the eyes of the various characters in the ensemble cast and then the second one is more of a macro macro view yeah. talking about the things I was talking about like the the temporary shelters and the NGOs and the protests on nuclear energy and what the media was saying what the government was saying what the government wasn't saying all the, all this stuff that i find so so fascinating and more important than hitting a, a bat hitting a ball with a bat so yeah there's so many layers to it but i think at, at the baseline like the core of it it's almost a it's a path back to normalcy it's okay we experienced yeah. this tragedy how do we get back to how, not how things were before but how do we get back to you know establishing a new normal and that means exactly. baseball on tv again people in the stands football back on tv again whatever it is you know basketball in a bubble but at least it's on tv whatever the new normal is you're just you're trying to find it again yeah. after a tragedy or in the midst of, uh-huh. of tragedy um uh, and then and it was but, evolving but, yeah. always too it was mm-hmm. like when, when they returned without without fans and then they returned but but there was a, a cap on how many fans and um they had an innings limit too or if it went three and a half already three and a half and um then they would just stop they wouldn't play anymore once they finished the inning um but anyway anyway yeah Fast. yeah there's a again the new normal and you're just ad- adapting to uh the circumstances uh so as, as far as tony goes as i was saying it's it's very inspirational again to the point of of it being basically you know, almost a disney movie uh except maybe in the disney movie he ends up winning the world series or something at the end of it but i felt like at least in reading it, I don't want to under I don't want to like undersell it or underestimate how big of a deal it was for him to make the majors. But to me, it seemed like the climax of the book was when they won the pennant, whereas like that was <laughs> almost the crowning achievement. And you know, him making it to the majors and playing for I think three four years there was almost like the epilogue to the climax of his career. Is that? I mean, what do you think? I like that. And I never really thought about that, but that makes so much sense. And also I feel like it's arguably a little ethnocentric to say that, but first of all, it was always his dream to play in the major leagues and, and get that major league contract. So I'm not, that's not ethnocentric, obviously that that's, that's his dream and it makes sense. And um, it's the best league in the world for baseball. But what I'm saying is to make it that, once he made his major league debut that that's like that feels like a little bit tunnel visioned and like uh like a maybe not ignorant american but just maybe like have some respect this is a high level league um one of the best in the world and he guided his team to the japan series and did so by eliminating the hated rival yomiuri giants that tormented him his his first season in japan they put up so many runs in the first inning off him and Alex Ramirez hitting these, these three run home runs off. Anyway. Um, so <laughs> he basically ended their dynasty, not him only, but the swallows collectively. It is a climax. I, I like that. And um, you could definitely argue that, but he had a successful rookie season with the Rangers and 
that was part of his dream. He didn't want to just play in the majors. He wanted to prove that he was good and had some staying power. It complicated a little bit that he was already 32 by the time that process started. But they they were the best team in the American League that year, even though they got swept, spoiler alert, but people <laughs> probably know, by the uh, Toronto Blue Jays in the first round. It was a phenomenal year. They were referred to as a team of destiny by an ESPN writer. They were winning something like 80% of their one-run games, which you could say is fluky, but they had a knack for winning these close games in dramatic fashions. And I thought it was pretty cool too. But but no, yeah, you could definitely argue that. And it could have just been a really long epilogue too. Where um, It's just how I, I felt like... two chapters yeah. mm-hmm. in MLB where he, he beans Pujols and... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all the all this stuff and um he's getting into a routine in Texas and adjusting to life back in the US but but yeah that was the most cinematic for me part of it um like you said the inspirational part of it like it could be a Disney movie where i just i think he said he still gets chills thinking about it when they're chanting his name in those those moments when um the pennant is on the line and then in the climax series. And and, I mean, they didn't win the Japan series, but as I talk about in the book, that was kind of beside the point. It was, that would have been nice if they did, but they, they got the pennant. They ended the Yomiuri giants dynasty at the time. They're like the Yankees of of NPB. So it's hard to feel bad for them. And the, the swallows had such a, such a tortured history and it's Yankees Mets basically <laughs> that's how it yeah, felt you could, you same, could argue same that. town but you know huge difference in the number of titles and, I talk about and Clippers, history Lakers too yeah Clippers, I'm a Clippers Lakers fan yeah. in LA even though it's stuff changes over time but still no no rings for those Clippers <laughs> ever um even when when they give hope like this year again but um so it was it was pretty cinematic and and joyful and memorable and he's never going to forget that as long as he lives and he won't forget his rookie season with the Rangers either but there was just there's just something special and redemptive about about that arc spending 6 years which is way more than he ever intended in Japan and Japan essentially resurrecting his career and you could argue transforming his life i would argue that no he, absolutely uh, he had his first kid in Japan. He got married during the time he was in Japan, even though it was back in Arizona. And he jokes about it. he was 26 when he went to Japan, but he kind of went there as a, a boy or an immature young man and and uh, just was completely different person when he came back on and off the field. Yeah, he really grew up there. And like you said, all these major life milestones happened there. And it just felt like, again, I don't want to undersell the 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 accomplishment of making it to the majors and sticking in the majors for the, the yeah, four years that he either. did. I didn't mean to do you that. Know, no, no, I know. I'm just saying it just felt like yeah. the journey. He's climbing up this mountain every year and he's getting the setbacks and he's getting injured and dealing with this and a position change and all this. And then he finally reaches you know, the mountaintop, which was winning the pennant and the climax series. And then it's like it, it almost felt like a victory lap. Like I did all this hard work and I made it. I finally made it to the majors and I can kind of exhale like, all right, I achieved my dream. And I mean, again, he's, he still played for a few years in, in, uh, in the majors, but it just, again, parts (laughs) of four seasons. Yeah. Parts of four seasons, including three with, with the Rangers. And I don't know if you're going to mention this, but he works for the Swallows now. So full circle. I love that. He that's in the epilogue where he um, he's now a scouting consultant or, or scout, you could call him, for the Yakult Swallows, the team that means so much to him. And he's able to be with his daughters in Arizona. He travels once a month or so um, locally in Arizona and on the West Coast. But he's able to just be around the game that he loves, be around his family. and he still has those ties with the Swallows and he's working in professional baseball, which is continuing the dream for him. Mm -hmm. So I just, I love that, that full circle element of it too. 
So again, a, a great book. I really enjoyed it. Make sure you guys go out and get it. Uh, you can probably find it. Where can we find it? I'm assuming all major uh, book retailers. Yeah. So, um, but it's not always physically in store and they can get it quickly. All you have to do is just ask them. You can call over the phone or, or um, go in in person and say a baseball gaijin and they'll look it up on their computer. They'll order it in if there aren't any copies in store, but Simon and Schuster is the distributor. So you can get it anywhere. It's, it's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble online, um, bookshop, which is for indie bound. If, if you want to support independent bookstores and that's, I think right now it's a little bit more because it's on sale um, on Amazon for twenty five ninety nine. I'm not sure how long it will be on sale, but it's a little bit more. But it goes to a good cause if you want to support independent bookstores, which I think is a really noble cause. But you can get it pretty much everywhere. I want to say, though, before we close out, that this was such a pleasure doing it with you. You had you. such smart questions and things that I've thought about, but I haven't been asked about yet. and. Um, I mean, I could nerd out about this for so long, but it just means so much to me that the book resonated with you in this way and that you got a lot of the things out of it that I was that I was hoping for. And yeah, so this is our first time talking about it. So me, you didn't you didn't feed yeah. me any of these questions or anything like that. Yeah, so. just so natural and <laughs> organic. And um, and you gave me a, a little bit of of sample questions, but it was just really big picture. I just I just really enjoyed I enjoyed this conversation. I'm grateful for it and for you. Thank you for it. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for your time. But before we, again, before we wrap up, what's next for you? You got another book uh, brewing in there? You got some other ideas I, cooking up? It's early. I would want to write another book, but there's nothing really to share right now. But but right now, it's just, it feels like a grind, but, but a joyful one. Though. I, there's just a lot of promo that I'm doing to just get this book out there as widely as possible because the story just means so much much to me i think it's a, a worthwhile story to tell and it can be challenging as a first time author writing about someone with not a lot of name recognition whose story is just so fascinating but people there it takes a lot of effort to get people to um to become aware of that and so that's been a fun interesting thing there's a learning curve definitely but it's it's getting more and more fun and enjoyable and progressively less stressful there's naturally a, an element of that because there's always going to be pressure and that enables you to to write a second book get a second book deal um if it gets more widely out there but no it's it's so good talking about it and um and if it sells a certain amount of copies then there'll be a paperback run which which would be tremendous. And awesome. I don't want to be too presumptuous and this may be difficult, but um, if it ever was adapted in the film or TV, because we were talking about the cinematic qualities of it, I would just be just over the moon excited for that. And I mean, even if it doesn't happen, that still, I still consider a success, but um, yeah, how cool would that be to, to see this? It'd be amazing on the silver and, screen yeah. or, or on the big screen. And again, like like we said, it it almost reads like a like a Disney movie script anyway. So <laughs> I don't think it'll take much uh, adapting to get the story to to fit. Uh, you know, a ninety minute or two hour narrative. So again, make sure you guys go out and get it. I'll hold the copy of the book up. It's a baseball gaijin chasing a dream to Japan and back by Aaron Fishman. I'll put a link, of course, in the description to. Uh, the Amazon or the, the indie bound, all the you know, different places you can find it online. Uh, make sure to leave us a, a review and subscribe to wherever you're listening or watching this podcast and make sure you follow us on all the major social media platforms at 4040 vision pod. Aaron, thank you so much for your time and thank you for writing this book. Again, I really enjoyed it and uh, I'll definitely be sharing it with uh, some of my other baseball fan buddies. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. Appreciate it.